Well, I am glad that you're here this morning, and I want to welcome in those who are watching us online. You can find us on uh, YouTube, Uncharted, or Emmanuel Baptist Church, Uncharted Bible Study. And uh, uh, for those watching, for those of you who are here in person but then may watch later, they're posted for us, uh, they're posted one week after I actually teach them. And so just uh, if you, if you want to re-listen to something I've said and you rush home this afternoon to listen to it, you won't be able to listen to it until next Wednesday. So, so just take note of that as well. We're studying the book of Matthew together. This morning I want to invite you to join me in Matthew chapter 17. It's where we're going to begin. And uh, I have uh, taken great pains the uh, first couple of weeks of this study to let you know that I am to the best of my ability going to teach the Gospel of Matthew with a Christocentric point of view. So many times when we read the Gospels, we are... Uh, we're, we're, we're looking at ourselves in the Gospels. If you're like me, uh, you look at Peter or John or Andrew and you imagine, well, what if I'd have been them? What if I'd have been there? You imagine yourself if Jesus were speaking to you. But this particular study, we're looking at Jesus himself. What was Jesus going through? What was Jesus thinking? What was his purpose? And how was that communicated and how was it translated to the disciples and those who would become his believers? We started in chapter 16. Uh, We didn't start in in Matthew chapter 1. We started in chapter 16 because 16 is a break. It's It's a line that the disciples finally cross with Jesus. It's as if Jesus has got 12 guys following him around, but they just... They just don't get it until Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, he says, who do people say that I am? And they say, oh, some say you're John the Baptist and Jeremiah and some one of the other prophets. And then he says, who do you say that I am? And it is the question of the ages. It is the question of judgment day. If you want to know who gets into heaven, heaven's not gained because you're good or you try to be good or you try to be a good person. Uh, the Bible goes kind of really bends over backwards to say nobody is saved by their own righteousness. Even in the Old Testament, the prophet says, your righteousness is as filthy rags. So there's none righteous, no, not one. So we need a righteousness and not our own. We need Jesus. And so the question, who do you say that I am, asked by Jesus himself, is the crucial question of the hour. It not only determines your eternal destiny, but really it determines uh, your purpose here on earth. And so he had to wait for these disciples to get to this place where they, they had it figured out. And Peter answers for the group and he says, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And so everything changes here at Matthew 16. He begins to treat them differently. They have a new understanding. Last week we talked about how he really took the time to uh, explain to them what church is, even though the church hadn't been born yet. The birth of the church is Acts chapter 2, but Matthew 16 is definitely the conception of the church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. On this rock, I will build my church. And so we live in a day and age when a lot of people call themselves church, A lot of buildings have a sign that say church in front of the building. But when we went through the characteristics of what a church is, we discover there are not near as many churches as people claim that there are. And so this is what a church looks like. People sometimes say to me, I've I've got to move to another city, got to move to another state. My job is transferring me. How do I find a good church? And so these characteristics that I taught last week, and go back and watch those, they will be posted this week. So uh, you can watch those and pick those up. We also know that right away, uh, Jesus is uh, still in conflict with Satan at a spiritual level that you and I still cannot understand. And, And Peter... Peter says all the right things beginning in verse 13. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Jesus says, wow, Peter, you got it. And I know you didn't figure it out on your own. God reveals this to you. And every one of us, that's how we're saved. Nobody here gets saved by your own intellectual conclusion. 
It's revealed to you by the Father and the Spirit. And then he goes on and he says in verse 21, I, I told you to turn to chapter 17. Just look back into chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. So it's from this time on, right? This is the, this is the line in the sand. He's now treating them differently than he used to. He's like, okay, now that you know I'm the Christ, now I can tell you this is the purpose of, of the coming of the Christ. The, the scribes and the Pharisees had only ever seen the... the uh, in day purpose. They had seen the millennial reign of Christ. They had seen the eternal reign of Christ, but they had never seen the suffering servant Christ. They had never seen the uh, atoning sacrifice Christ. And so he begins to explain that now. And now Peter blows it again, verse 22. So Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now just, just for a moment, just think of the pride that goes with, just think... Just think, hey, Jesus, I need to straighten you out. <laughs> just, just, oh, bless his heart. He just, so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Far be it from you, Lord. That'll never happen to you. And, and, uh, and uh, the, the response is stunning to us. It's, it seems overly harsh to poor Peter, but Jesus recognizes it's not Peter and he says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not set in your mind on the things of God, but the things of man. I wish that, uh, this, this, boy, this sounds really crazy to even say. I wish that maybe the Lord had been harsher with me a few times. Because I did not set my mind on the things of God, but I've set my mind on the things of man. And the reason I wish maybe the Lord had rebuked me earlier is I stayed there for not for 30 seconds like Peter did, but I stayed there for a day or a two or a week or two or a month or two. And I was just all focused on earthly things and the things of man. What is really interesting, one of the most interesting studies of the New Testament are these, uh, not, not the 12, because uh, Judas, of course, hangs himself and betrays the Lord, but the 11, and then, and then Paul is added in the 12. What's really interesting is the study of the 12 after the resurrection. After the resurrection, we never really find, we, we find that these guys are still human, but we never really find that they ever make this mistake again. They never really get caught up with the things of man. There is no record there is no record of any of the 12 running for political office. There is no record of any of them writing a, uh, a political commentary. There's really no record of them saying anything about Caesar or Rome or the government there's no record of them saying hardly anything about uh, civil or social injustices. They literally only had one message, and they stuck to it, that Jesus was the Son of God and that he was coming again. It's really remarkable when you think about it. Jesus is the Son of God, and he's going to return. He's coming again. And these guys had every opportunity to say all kinds of different things. They, uh, they were public speakers. They were in churches. They began to travel all over the known world. They wrote uh, letters and documents which are preserved, and we have them in our Bibles 2,000 years later. They... Uh, 
never ever got entangled in earthly things again. They knew the purpose to which they had been called and they never were confused after the resurrection. They were always on point, on message, on mission. Jesus is the son of God, he's going to return. They did preach against sin, but the sin that they preached against most was the sin of unbelief to people who didn't believe that he was the Messiah. And they spoke of his return over and over and over again. On average, as you read through your New Testament, once every 27 verses, his second coming is mentioned. Very easy to remember, 27 books in the New Testament, every 27 verses, oh yeah, Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. This, this is their theme. So they are different than you and I, different than me. I'll at least put myself there because I get stuck on earthly things. I, I have my mind on things of man rather than things of God. And I find myself drawn to the news, watching whatever the news cycle is. And I find myself thinking about how much money I've got in my 401k. And I find myself thinking about, do I have enough to retire when that day comes? And I find myself thinking, how much should I or should I not help my children? And, and I think, I've I, I got all these, stuff, I want all these worries, right? Have you not got all those worries? You think to yourself, all these things, I've got to figure this out. And I, do, I, do I need to invest in gold? And is the American dollar going to tank? And what's going to happen next? And, and, the, and because we're believers, we know, we kind of know some things, right? Is it going to get better or is it going to get worse? It's so funny to me. You guys are all complaining all the time that it's getting worse. You already know it's going to get worse. It's going to grow gloriously dark. It's the, it's the signs of the coming of Christ. And this is what they say all through the New Testament. They say, Jesus is the son of God. He's going to come again. He's coming again. And so I find myself in this struggle. And Peter gets this immediate rebuke. And then we have this teaching that leads us right to Matthew 17. It says in verse 24 of 16, if anyone wants to follow me, this is what it looks like. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He says, if anyone wants to follow me, there are two prerequisites to the following. Yeah, number one, deny yourself. This is, that, this is that part where I decide I'm not the boss of my life. I'm not the master of my life. I'm not the king that I'm trying to serve. It's not all about me. And I don't think we've ever lived, at least in my lifetime, that it's, we're more narcissistic now than we've ever been. To deny yourself is just unheard of. And then the idea, take up your cross. And uh, I know that that gets used metaphorically. I, I don't think that Jesus is using it metaphorically. I think he's using it literally. The idea is whenever uh, someone was crucified, and the Romans loved crucifixion as their form of capital punishment for anyone who was not a Roman citizen, they, it was, uh, it was a, they, they believed it was a great deterrent um, to crime and to uh, insurrection because the uh, death of, uh, by crucifixion normally took three days. It was a very slow and painful and agonizing death and it was an object lesson. The Romans would always use it as an object lesson. This is what happens if you uh, fight Rome. And so... Um, uh, when he said, take up your cross, so what would always happen is whoever was going to be crucified was responsible for carrying his own cross to the place of the crucifixion. It was just the Roman custom. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus. He carried his own cross until he, uh, the beating was so bad, he, he finally physically collapsed and he couldn't. And that's when they, they grabbed somebody to carry it for him. So when he says, uh, deny yourself and take up your cross, the disciples knew exactly what he was talking about. This is, a, this is the idea that you, uh, you put yourself to death. Uh, later, the Apostle Paul would say, I die daily. I, I get up every day and I crucify that flesh. Because if I don't, it wants to take over me. It wants to start saying to me things like, hey, you haven't had chocolate cake in at least eight hours. 
you know, it wants to come back and, and, and attack me. So, so you crucify the flesh, you deny yourself, and then you can follow. He writes his own commentary, verse 25, whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Now, he is speaking a little bit about, remember he's just said to Peter back up in verse 23, you're not setting your mind on things of God, but you're thinking about things of man. So this is that commentary, verse 26. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul, he forfeits his soul? Or what would a man give in return for his soul? And then here is what I've alluded to. The scripture just always turns to the coming of Christ. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he's done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man. And what this really says is is the, the glory in his kingdom, the coming of the glory in his kingdom. Now, this is the verse that a lot of uh, atheists or people who want to prove that the, the Bible is false point to. They go like, Jesus had a prophecy here, and he said to the disciples, some of you will still be alive when he comes back. And they're all dead. So here's a proof that Jesus is a false prophet. Well, what he's really saying here is that some of you are going to see the, the glory of the coming, and it happens in Matthew 17. You got Matthew 17? So finally, it took me a little bit to get there. I finally arrived. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and this is the inner three, and he led them up to a high mountain. Most theologians think this is Mount Hermon, which uh, is one of the highest mountains in all of the Middle Eastern area. It's like 9,100 feet. So when you think of the pass up there, uh, uh, Red Lodge, you know, that's like, what, 90, 99? So this is a, uh, for, a, for a country that's flat and close to the sea, it's a very high mountain. And then without any fanfare or any other introduction, verse 2 just says, and he was transfigured before them. Now, it's the same word that appears in Romans uh, chapter 12, 1 and 2, which says we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But it clearly has a different meaning here. And so uh, what's happened here with Jesus is something that never happens before this time, it's never recorded, and never happens after this time, never recorded. And that is that for this moment in time, Jesus does not veil his glory. Uh, we won't take the time to turn there. You might want to just write yourself a note so that you can turn there. In uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, in there about verse 6 or 7, uh, it talks about the fact that when Jesus, uh, Jesus who, who was God and didn't think it was, uh, uh, he's the son of God. He, he was always the son of God. So being God wasn't something he was trying to attain. It was something that he had. That Jesus, God, emptied himself and made himself of no reputation and he became in the likeness of man. And theologians have often tried to debate, what, is, what did he empty himself of? Well, he, he never emptied himself of his divinity. He always claimed to be the son of God. He always claimed to be divine. He, he never in, emptied himself of his attributes. God is love. God is patient. God is merciful. God is great. He didn't cease Uh, to being God, what was it that Jesus did when he took on flesh and became a man? Well, he emptied himself, if you will. He, he, he veiled the, the writers of the new Testament prefer that phrase, his glory. So, uh, when you get a Christmas card and the Christmas card has got baby Jesus in a manger, in a stable, and he's glowing, That's not theologically correct. He was born like every other baby that's ever been born. He he didn't come out of the womb glowing. He, in fact, he never glowed except once. And on this occasion, for his own purposes that have to do with later what we'll read with John and Peter, um, he allows these three men 
to see his glory. No one else ever got to see it. The, in fact, the writers of the Old Testament said he, he wasn't exceptionally handsome. You know, he didn't have a... I, I have certain illustrations that I cannot use with anyone else but you. So I love to use them here. He didn't look like Errol Flynn, right? So see, I can't use that in church with the teenagers. They don't know... They don't even know what it means to be in like Flynn. So, uh, so he, di- he, didn't, he didn't look like Hollywood. He was nothing that was exceptionally attractive about him. And he didn't glow. He, he, he didn't have the glory of God. In the Old Testament, it says the, Moses was led by the glory of God, a, a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of smoke in the daytime. It was the presence of the, the Hebrew word Shekinah, the glory of God. But when Jesus comes, part of the reason no one recognizes him is he doesn't come in the glory of God. Except in Matthew 17, just for a brief moment. There are, there are six characters in the story. Um, I've already referred to Jesus. He is the center. We're, we, he's the center of it all. That's where Christocentric now in our study. Um, Peter, James, and John are there. Uh, God the Father is going to make his presence known. And then there is uh, Moses and Elijah. And so maybe that's seven. Seven characters there. Seven characters all together. Here's how it goes. Verse two, and he, Jesus, was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we are here. If you wish, we'll make three tents or booths or altars here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Um, We have no idea how he knew that that was Moses and Elijah. I don't know. Uh, Maybe when they showed up, Jesus said, Moses, Elijah, good to see you again. I don't know. He was still speaking, uh, which is typical of Peter. He's still talking. When behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Everything's bright. Everything's bright. So a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces. They were terrified. This is an understatement. Jesus came and touched them saying, rise, rise. Don't be afraid, have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. I heard one of the great sermons that I've ever heard personally when a man said, you need to see Jesus only. If you can live your life and only see Jesus, you'll be just fine. Um, this is one of those events that is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all record it. Um, Mark is really the gospel of Peter. Peter really, uh, Mark, John Mark is really the, more of the secretary, the scribe. And so when we read this account in Mark, um, Peter makes sure that we understand. He says, he says that when Peter said, uh, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us build altars for you and Elijah and Moses. Then there's a parenthesis that says, he said this because he didn't know what he was saying. Because Peter's default is to talk. If there's, if there's, if there's quiet, he should jump in there, right? He should speak. And so uh, he always speaks first and thinks later. And so he, he says his own gospel then is like, I, I didn't know what I was saying. And uh, the one who hushes him is the father's voice. We are accustomed to the, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. We remember, we remember that from the baptism of Jesus. But now he adds, the father adds, listen to him. You and I live in a world where the most common 
religious belief in the world is that there's really only one God and we all worship the same God in all kinds of different ways. So it doesn't really matter whether we're Jewish or Hindu or Muslim or what we are because it's all the same God and we're all really going the same direction and it's all going to work out in the end. It is, the, it is a demonic myth. Here we have once again, this is my son, listen to him. He would say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's always only ever been about Jesus. It is Christocentric. You've got to do this study where you're like, I've got to find where Christ is in the story. And so here we have his transfiguration. Now, uh, all, all the disciples, after the resurrection, they only had the one sermon. I just told it to you. The sermon was that Jesus is the Son of God and he's coming again. But they would prove, uh, they would use as proof that he was the Son of God, the resurrection. That's what they would go to over and over and over again. How do you know Jesus is the Son of God? Because I saw him die and I saw him alive three days later. I ran to the tomb. We are eyewitnesses of the fact that the tomb is empty and he was alive, he appeared to us. And they would do that over and over and over again. But two of these guys, James, remember, dies an early death. James is martyred uh, by Herod. And, uh, and so after that, only two of the inner three remain, uh, Peter and John. Peter and John talk about this day. And I want, you to, I want you to see those passages. Turn with me first to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Um, when, when John writes the gospel of John, it is much, much later than the writing of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have been written at least 25 years before the writing of John. Maybe even 35 years. So um, in all likelihood, John has copies of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When John writes the Gospel of John, he's the last living apostle. All the others have died a uh, martyr's death. And by the way, not once have they ever turned their attention to earthly things again. Uh, none of them uh, in the anguish of death, Peter's uh, traditionally is an upside down crucifixion. Not one of them ever said, oh, oh, okay, okay, don't kill me, we made it up. Not one of them. Not one said, oh, he didn't really rise from the dead, please don't kill me. Not one of them. They all went to the death proclaiming Christ and uh, just rejoicing that they could be persecuted in such a way as Christ was persecuted. Only John dies from natural causes. And he, he lives to be very old. It's very likely that he lives to be 100 years or, or older. And so he has Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's the last living eyewitness. And the Holy Spirit inspires him to write, I refer to it as a bonus gospel. Um, theologians call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic gospels. John is the extra gospel. It's the, it's the icing. It's the bonus gospel. And, he, and so he takes on himself to write some things that the others did not write. Now he writes some of the same things. It's the same story. So of course he's got to write, this is, this is how, what Jesus did. And here's the, here's the crucifixion and the burial and the resurrection. But he gives us some other material. So he, he even begins the book in a completely different way. And so in John chapter 1, he begins like, like it's Genesis, right? I mean, the first three words are, in the beginning, just like Genesis. But John is going to make it clear who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, he has given us a commentary on Genesis. And so everything that was made was made by him and through him and for him. That's what Paul would say in Colossians. And it may astound you to know that none of the apostles were evolutionists. 
They all believed in the creation, uh, the, the divine edict, let there be light kind of creation in the world. Verse four, in him was life. And that light, that life was the light of men and the light shined in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. This is actually in terms of talking about science and physics. This is a physical impossibility. Nobody here, how many of you have a flashlight in your, in your car or beside your bed at home? Okay. How many of you, by the show of hands, how many of you have a flash dark? No, nobody does. You can take a flashlight in your house, the power can go out, whatever, you can turn it on, and there is a beam of light which can permeate the darkness. There is no such thing as a flash dark. I can't make a beam of darkness that permeates the light. It's, a, it's against the laws of physics. It's a physical impossibility. So who's going to win the battle, Satan or Jesus? The light wins. The light always wins. Always. So, so get in the light. Come to the light. And the light can't overcome it and it can't comprehend it. Let me skip to verse 9 for sake of time. The true light which enlightens everyone. Now he's talking about our souls. He's not talking about a flashlight. He's talking about our souls. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, still a reference to creation, yet the world did not know him. He did not come in his glory. He emptied himself of his glory. He veiled his glory. He wasn't recognizable. In verse 11, he came to his own. Here he's speaking specifically about the children of Abraham, the Jews. He came to his own people and they did not receive him. I love verse 12. If you underline in your Bible, here's a verse to underline. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become the children of God. How do you become a child of God? You're born not of blood, not of the physical processes, nor of the will of the flesh, but, uh, or of the will of man. You're born of God. You're born again. And John will introduce that two chapters from now in John chapter 3, the only one to show us that. And he says in verse 19, and the word, remember verse 1, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And now John is going to talk about the transfiguration. And we have seen his glory. He's not talking about Jesus after the resurrection. He's talking about his glory. There was only one time when his glory wasn't veil, veiled. It was Matthew 17. It was the Mount of Transfiguration. John will never forget it. We beheld his glory, the glory as the only son from the Father. Do you remember the words? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. John would never forget those words. He's changed. He is full of grace and full of truth. Verse 16. And from his fullness, we have all received grace Upon grace. Uh, Eddie's got a song that he loves to sing in our worship, Grace on Top of Grace. This is where it comes from, right here. It's, it's, it's incredible that you and I would receive grace. That's, that's beyond our imagination. John says, we receive grace on top of grace. On top of grace, on top of grace. How many of you have uh, like, got a seven-layer dip that you really like? I'm, I'm secretly hoping for some of that at the Super Bowl, just looking at one person who might could be in charge of that in my life. Some of you have a seven-layer lasagna, right? And, and uh, you got a seven-layer chocolate cake. And all these things that I'm talking about, it's, it's flavor on top of flavor on top of flavor. There's a reason that we like that, right? Here John is talking about layers and layers of grace. Do you realize who you are? 
to all who received him, to, he, to them he gave them the right, the power to become the children of God. Grace on top of grace. There's a reason why you don't have to worry about earthly things. There's a reason why you don't have to get caught up in the, in the things that are of the earth or of man because we belong to a different kingdom and it's grace on top of grace. And he says it came... Here's, here's what he says. So verse 16, for from his fullness then we've all received grace upon grace for the law was given through Moses. He's still referring to the Mount of Transfiguration. Otherwise, there's no reason to talk about Moses here. If Moses wasn't there at creation. He's, there's no reference to him at all so far. But he's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. The, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And then he says, no one's ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. What is it that God the Father has clearly done? He has in his record, in the revelation of himself, he has revealed himself by pointing us to Jesus. Later, the writers of the New Testament would say that God the Father gives all judgment to the Son. So when the whole world talks about, oh, well, we all serve the same God, we're all going the same direction, that God is not actually going to be the one that you stand before on Judgment Day. You stand before Jesus. So then it matters, who do you say that I am? If it's, if it's flippantly one of a hundred ways to get to God the Father, that is not the right answer. Nobody else was transfigured. Nobody else ever even had to veil their glory. Can you, imagine, can you imagine me getting up in the morning after I get out of the shower and saying to Patrice, how do I veil my glory today? No. Right? So, so think it through for a second. No, the, Mahatma Gandhi and Muhammad and Buddha, they never had to veil their glory. They are not the way to God. But Jesus actually had to do it so he could do the work and go to the cross and atone for us. And I didn't finish Matthew 17, but when he comes down from the mountain, he says to them, don't tell anybody about this until after the resurrection. Because he's got to get to the cross. When Peter says, oh, oh, no, wait a second, Jesus. You can't go to the cross. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You want the things of man, not the things of God. I've got to go to the cross. There is no grace on top of grace if he doesn't get to the cross. The cross is the atonement for our sins. The resurrection is the proof that he had the power to do what he said he did at the cross. So all of this now makes sense to us. I'm running out of time, but I, I want you to go with me to uh, 2 Peter. So I told you, James never gets to write about this. Uh, the Lord takes him fairly early in the story chronicled there in the book of Acts. He's martyred. Um, but uh, John would live a long time. Uh, Peter lives a fairly long time. He's going to live another, uh, after this, another 30 or 35 years. Um, in in uh, Christian tradition, he is uh, crucified upside down outside of Rome. Some even believe that, Rome, that uh, at Rome, Peter and Paul were imprisoned at the same time for a little while. And so uh, Peter uh, writes uh, first and second Peter. Um, he almost always uses a scribe. Peter is not educated. He's not formally educated. Educated, He is very much different than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul has what we would call in modern, modern times a Harvard ed education. And, and, and Paul's brilliant. People who go back and read Paul would just say, if we were guessing his IQ, he's, he's 170, 175, 180. Nobody ever said that of Peter. Uh, so Peter's not great with grammar. And uh, Greek is not his first language. And, um, but he probably writes Second Peter himself. We can tell because it's just, it's more rudimentary, it's more basic. Listen to what he writes, Second Peter chapter one, verse 16. We did not follow cleverly devised myths 
when we made known to you the power and the, would this surprise you? The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Once every 27 verses, the coming of Christ, the coming of Christ. Uh, Peter doesn't say this about himself. Peter's not capable of devising a cleverly uh, devised myth. He's, he, he's not. He is a, he's a blue-collar, regular guy fisherman. He's a, he's a salt-of-the-earth best friend, but he's, it's, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. He's, he's not, he, this, we didn't devise these clever myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ instead, but, last phrase of verse 16, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Uh, the word here is used as a synonym for the word glory. And now he's going to talk about Matthew 17. He's going to talk about the Mount of Transfiguration. For when he, Jesus, received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was borne to him by the capital M, majestic, capital G, glory. It was borne to him by the majestic glory. And what did the majestic glory, what did God the Father say? This is my Beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves, verse 18, we heard this very voice born from heaven. We were with him on the holy mountain. This is Peter, who is in his old age, very likely writing from prison, maybe a prison in Rome, Second Peter, late in the New Testament, 65, 70 AD, and he remembers, he's thinking back now, 35 years ago, Mount Hermon. Jesus took John and James and me. And we go up, and then this thing happens, which we never expected. His glory was always veiled, and we, we can't make this up. This is what we saw. This is what we heard. We are eyewitnesses. We heard this voice. And the application is astounding to us. In verse 19, he says, and we have something more sure. We have the prophetic word of God. You say, what's the prophetic word of God? Skip down to verse 20. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. They didn't make it up. It's not a devised, clever myth. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. This is the exact phrase that John uses in John chapter 1 when he says, those who received him are born not of the will of man. So he says, no one... It wasn't produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by his Holy Spirit. Now, John and Peter never get over what they saw. They never forget it. Mount of Transfiguration, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, if you were there, you would never forget it either. You, would, you could never forget seeing Jesus change and seeing him in all of his glory. Only time it happens in terms of the, the, the record. So they, they talk about it. Then they say, we're eyewitnesses of it. And they use it as a proof that he's the son of God and that he's what? He's coming back. Always together. They never just really preach he's the son of God. He's the son of God who's going to return. Always together. But then Peter says the most remarkable thing. We have, verse 19, we have something more certain than that we have the word of God. This is what John was writing about. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh. So here's what's really important. I want to just do a little theology with you just for a second. And by the way, if you can get this, it, it will just clarify things for you and you won't get tricked by a whole bunch of things that are religious in nature. Peter says, we had the most, John says it too, we had the most incredible experience. But our salvation is not based on the experience. 
The experience was real. Jesus really did let down the veil. We really did see his glory. We really did hear God. It is a proof of what's real. But we don't interpret the word of God by our experience. Peter says we have something more certain. We have the word. What is he saying? We interpret our experiences by the word. This is what divides, this is, this is a dividing line in Christendom. Do you use experience to interpret the word of God or do you use the word of God to interpret your experiences? Think about it because it's a dividing line. If you use your experiences to interpret the word of God, then your experiences are higher than, more absolute, and more trustworthy than the word, and you change the word to suit your experience. If, however, the word is what is highest and absolute, then you use the word to evaluate what kind of experience you had. It's really important. And Peter says, we had the experience of all experiences. We saw Jesus in his glory, in his honor. He uses the word majesty. God the Father came down. This is my son. We saw Elijah. We saw Moses. It's glowing. But we have something more certain than that. We have the word of God. It's really powerful. I have had, on occasion, folks came, come to me and try to convince me of something because of an experience that they had. And after we talk a little bit, they say, no, no, you don't understand. I really had this experience, to which I have to say, I'm not doubting that you had the experience. We're talking about the interpretation of it. Uh, one time I was talking to a woman, and we had a chance to sit down and talk at length, and so we got to the place where we talked about her salvation. And she said, yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. I said, tell me about, tell me how that came about. And she said, well, one night I was in my bedroom. I was fearful and uh, I saw a glow and there was a, there was a, there was a light and it was like in the living room and I could tell that it came down the hallway and that light came to my bedroom door. And then I wasn't fearful. And I was going, and I said, and? And she goes, and that's why I know I'm going to heaven. I was like, okay. I said, uh, that's a really great experience, but that's not how you get to heaven. She goes, no, I really had that experience. I said, I, I believe you. But that experience doesn't save you. Do you, do you see what we're talking about here? All kinds of people today, and you can go down to Barnes and Noble right after this, and you can get all these books about people's experiences, and Satan's really great at counterfeiting religious experiences, but we have something more sure. If you underline your Bible, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention. It's like a lamp shining in a dark place. There's the old flashlight, flash dark thing again. It's a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, where does theology start? Starts with the word. That's why John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. It's the revelation of God of himself. No prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men were spoke from God when they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So here we have this incredible experience. Nothing like it recorded in all the Bible, only one time Jesus lets his glory shine through, the Mount of Transfiguration. Only three guys, earthly guys, we can't count Moses and Elijah, only three earthly guys saw it. One of them died shortly thereafter. The two others would write about it. And what would they write? They would write about it in connection to the word. So 
Peter says to you and, and I, in effect, because it's, he's, he knows guys like me, I would say, I still would say, wouldn't you have loved to have been there? Wouldn't you like to have been on the Mount of Transfiguration? You would never forget it your entire life, just like John and Peter. But Peter says, if you have to only have one, take the word. This is the one. You have something more certain than an experience. This is the revelation of God himself to you. Isn't it incredible that we... We don't read it, we don't study it, we don't think about it, we don't look at it, and this is what we have. God has revealed himself to us that we might know Jesus. And what might we know? He's the son of God, and he's coming back. He's going to return. Let me finish by saying this. There's a, there'll be a day, I don't know what exactly what it looks like, but the only thing we have to compare it to is an inauguration, Right? There will be an inaugural day when Jesus is crowned, a coronation, not an inauguration, when Jesus is crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, we will be there on that day in the VIP section. We will be there. You say, how do you know? Because we have the prophetic word. He's told us the word of God. Amen and amen. amen.